my name is Captain Bert Menchel, and I joined the boat in Spain, in Barcelona, Spain, in 1963, November 63. And it was due to my brother, Ken, my older brother. There were five Menchel boys, and Ken, the oldest, emigrated to Vancouver in 1957. And we were in you know, correspondence occasionally. So one day, Max Wyman, the previous owner of the Wild Goose brought the ship in for maintenance at this shipyard in Vancouver and inquired about hiring an engineer for the summer season. And my brother was the only single guy in the yard. So he got the job. And just then, well, around that time, John Wayne expressed an interest in buying the boat. And so he did. I think he paid $110,000 for it. So uh, my brother was on board, and within a few months, John Wayne decided to, he wanted to cross the Atlantic in it to do the movie Circus World in the Barcelona, Spain. When my brother found out about that, he, oh, I don't want to cross the Atlantic, I get seasick. So, <laughs> oh, he'd already got a $50 a month raise from Max. Max told John Wayne what he was paying him, but he bumped it up by 50 bucks. So my brother was pretty happy on that. So, I guess John Wayne's manager found out my brother didn't want to, he wanted to quit. So they gave him another 50 bucks a month raise. So luckily for me, he stayed on board. They, uh, I guess most of the people on board were getting seasick, you know, uh, including my brother. My brother would get sick as a dog. He'd have to carry a bucket around in the engine room to throw up in. <laughs> so they get to Spain, they finish the movie, Oh, incidentally, it was Rita Hayworth's last movie. And uh, so my brother came home to England for about five days. And I picked him up at the railway station and took him home, put the kettle on for a cup of tea, typical English people. So while I'm fixing the tea, he nonchalantly said, you can go back to California on the yacht if you want with me. And I was going, yes. I was dreading another English winter in the rain. <laughs> so I was working outdoors in construction. So uh, I had a five days, I quit my job. All my mates were jealous. Oh, you're going to California. Oh, you're a lucky dog. <laughs> so, okay, my brother and I flew to Barcelona, Spain. And together, we had to get a cab to go to the dock where the boat was berthed. I remember my brother saying to the driver, gracias, you know, and I looked at him, you speak in Spanish, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we joined the boat. And my first impression of the boat, it was gleaming white paint. And I'm used to the dirty old tram steamers in Liverpool that I used to work on. And there's this beautiful, brilliant white yacht in the sunshine. So anyway, I meet the captain, Pete Stein. He turned out to be a character. He liked to spike his coffee with J&B whiskey. So he was always in a happy mood. <laughs> so anyway, I think we had time to walk up and down the main street in Barcelona, my brother and I. Got back to the boat. The next morning we decided to leave. And the dock where the boat was moored, there was a concrete key or a wall in front of the boat, or probably about 20 feet away. Well, with Pete having a few coffees, too many, he told the crew to, okay, let the lines go. There were just two lines attached to the boat. And I think I was on the dock, maybe. Anyway, the boat, as soon as Captain Pete said, let the lines go, the, the boat started easing forward. He didn't realize it was in gear. Whoever had polished the handles of the, in the wheelhouse left one gear shift in gear, forward gear. So the boat starts moving forward and crashes into the con concrete wall <laughs> and puts a little V in the bow. <laughs> uh, boy. Uh, well, we, we later, the, the crew, we were joking that Pete had run the boat into the rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> so we left the next morning and uh, cruised down to Gibraltar to take on more stores, fuel, and what have you, fresh water. And then slowly cruised down to the Canary Islands. And I remember going ashore shopping to buy some postcards in the Canary Islands. I forget which island it was. Tenerife, maybe. And I was 
very impressed with the gorgeous girls, shopkeepers, the native population, of beautiful girls. So anyway, we finished refueling, set off again across the Atlantic, and it took us nine days at uh, about 12 knots cruising. Uh, they call it the southerly route, and it was good weather, but kind of following the seas. So I was doing the engine room watch, and I spent, I'd inspect the engines for leaks or fires or anything. Then I go up on the top deck aft and sit on the cap rail in the sunshine, enjoying the cruise. <laughs> oh, and Peter gave me one of the state rooms, one of the guest rooms, instead of putting me with the crew up forward, where it wasn't quite so, the ride was rocky up front, the bow going up and down like this on the waves. So I was aft, uh, nice, plus the cabin on the opposite side of the ship was my brother's cabin. So we thought it'd be fun to, for us to be together, almost. You know. So anyway, we get to close to Panama Canal, and we must have made about half a day out. Um, Pete Stein heard on the ship's radio that uh, President Kennedy had just been shot. Boy, he was in tears. Didn't mean much to me. But, uh, so we stopped in Panama Canal. Oh, and we'd hit a log and bent both propellers. A lot of floating logs in that area. So Pete, the captain, hired a professional uh, scuba diver to go down, and I guess there were two of them. I remember thinking, boy, the, the sharks in this water, I wouldn't like to go diving underwater, you know. Apparently there weren't many sharks there. So I could hear them hammering on the bronze blades to try and get the kinks out. So they couldn't do it a perfect job, but they got a little better. We got them fixed when we got up to San Diego. So from uh, the canal zone, I think we were there about a week, and we headed north to Acapulco. I like Acapulco. And I thought I could handle the heat being in Saudi Arabia for two years in the Air Force, but it's a dry heat there. In Acapulco, it's a very uh, damp, sweaty heat. You know? <laughs> but I got to water ski around Acapulco Bay, and we met this Italian boat builder that was a professional, I guess he was the American or Mexican water ski champion back in the late 40s. I've forgotten his name now, but he would take me water skiing around the, the big bay of Acapulco. I remember being, I hope we don't fall down, there's sharks around here. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're waiting for John Wayne to join the boat That's with his right. wife and family. But I guess he was too busy finishing off on the movie in Hollywood. So we finally moved on to uh, La Paz, Mexico, Baja. And they, he, they joined us one evening, it was late in the evening. And I didn't get to, I guess I was down below in the cruise quarters. So I got to meet him the next morning. And my job and the other deckhand was to mop the, both decks down with a mop to get the, wipe the dew up, any dust, especially there'd be dew on the top deck. So Pete Stein grabbed me and said, come on, meet the boss in the main salon. So I stepped into the salon and John Wayne said, uh, six foot four, you know, and whoa, shake his hand and we had a little small talk about what I did back in England. And, and suddenly he goes, looks at my shoe and oh, and I'm, I'm shocked, I'm stunned. I pull my foot back and a little bit of goop landed on the rug and he comes over and puts his hand on my shoulder. I always spit on new shoes, Bert, with good luck. <laughs> I'd never heard of that, <laughs> but I was dumbfounded. Whoa! <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's see, we move from La Paz to Cabo San Lucas, the tip of Baja, and we're anchored in a little resort area. There's one fancy hotel, a place called Chileno, it's about 10 miles around the corner on the tip of Baja. So on a Saturday evening, the crew wanted to go for drinks and party in Cabo. And I was going to go with them. And we have dinner, which is at six o'clock. It was about 6.30, we're stepping in. Oh, the, we had a plywood dinghy on board, about 16 feet long, uh, maybe as wide as the table. And it would hold oh, up to four or five crew members. So the cr crew decided they wanted to go party and see if they could find some senioritas in Cabo. 
and I was going to be the last crew member to step into the dinghy. And Pete had told the Mexican mate, he was 28, ex-Mexican Navy, he should have known better. And Pete says, Captain Pete, don't take the dinghy all the way to, the, the, to Cabo. Take the dinghy to the beach and go by cab into town. Well, I was going to be the last guy to step into the dinghy. And something came over me, I just felt lazy and couldn't be bothered. So I, the boat looked kind of crowded anyway. I said, you guys go ahead, I'm going to stay on the big boat. So against the captain's orders, they went all the way in the dinghy. Partied, had a few drinks on the way back. It was windy and choppy. And Raul, which was the smallest guy on the, on the dinghy, about five foot nothing, he stood up to move aft, tripped on the bow line, fell overboard. The other three crew members panicked, tried to drag him over the side of the dinghy because the whole dinghy just capsized. No life jackets. So they started feeling the effects of hypothermia. And Raul, the smallest guy that had fallen overboard, they were all soaking wet, cold, it was windy. So he decided to try and swim to the beach about three or four miles away. He didn't get too far, maybe 20 yards and disappeared. And uh, Eduardo, the Mexican mate, they were both from Acapulco. So he swims over to try and save his buddy. Next thing, he's disappeared. I found out later that that place is infested with hammerhead sharks. So they probably were gobbled up, you know. We didn't even find a shoe. In the morning, Pete realized that dinghy wasn't back, crew's missing. So he woke me up. I was up in the forward crew's quarters. He said, the crew didn't get back last night. Let's get, jump in the dory or the Boston Whaler and cruise down the coast and see if we could see them. We get near Cabo and there's, I could see two figures on the rocks on the beach waving. So I thought, well, there's at least two of them. So we get closer, realize it wasn't the crew, it was a couple of Mexicans just waving. So then we talked to a yacht owner at Cabo and he said, oh yeah, we, we offered to put them up for the night. And they said, no, we got to get back to the, the boat. And then, so we got back to the Wild Goose in Jeleno. And uh, in the meantime, one of John Wayne's neighbors, a guy called Elmer Herr, he owned a 70 foot sport fishing boat called the uh, Dorsal. And he'd spotted the one survivor hanging on the dinghy. So poor Ephraim had been hanging on for 10 hours on the side of the dinghy, couldn't swim. So he's hanging on, his cheeks were rubbing all with bleeding, rubbing up and down all night. Uh, they said there was one, at least one shark circling when he was picked up. So we, we couldn't speak Spanish, but the captain could speak Spanish. He used to run cargo boats from Costa Rica to LA, banana boats. So he got the whole story from the one survivor and what happened. So I often think I was a strong water polo player and I wonder if I could have swum to the beach. But you, you can't swim too good with a shark hanging on a leg. <laughs> so I probably would have been gobbled up too. <laughs> Just. A funny story concerned the owner of the, uh, this little resort hotel in Jeleno, where the boys were drowned close by. His name was Bud Parr, and he talked to John Wayne when he found out that we were going to go to Europe. He said, oh, I'd love to... Uh... Oh, I guess this was later on, and the boat was going south again. So they stopped at Cabo on the way to Europe. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the owner talked to John Wayne and said, I'd love to make a trip like that to Europe. On the... And Duke says, well, the only thing stopping you is a pair of boat shoes. So the guy goes out and buys a, buys a pair of boat shoes, but pa, and the first day when they leave his resort area, he's sick as a dog. <laughs> so he, he was start to stay on the boat. They went through the canal and across the Atlantic to the Azor Islands. And John Wayne likes to tell the story. He says, if, if there hadn't have been an airport at the, at the Azores, he'd still be there. <laughs> he, would, he wouldn't go to go back to the States by sea, you know. Anyway, I guess he made it. So then we head up to uh, San Diego. And we stopped at the, what's that fancy hotel in San Diego? Los Coronados, yeah. 
stayed there for a few days, and then I thought I'd take off a few days and fly, uh, get a Greyhound coach up to Vancouver and visit my younger brother, Ron, and his family. So I no sooner got there, and we got a phone call, you get your tail back here, uh, John Wayne wants to, oh no, Max Wyman, the previous owner, wanted to charter the boat for about six weeks during the summer, and I think that this was February, I think. So, uh, oh, I like to tell people I arrived here in the States the same time as the Beatles, February, March of 64, yeah, 64. So anyway, I, I get to Canada and get a phone call right away, you get, get your tail back to San Diego, Max wants to charter the boat. So I flew back to San Diego, and we leave, head north to uh, uh, Seattle. That's where Max lived. So he cruised up into the Canadian waters for about six weeks. And uh, that, when that was through, then John Wayne joined the boat for more cruising. He loved to fish. He'd go out fishing in the morning after breakfast, come back about one o'clock for lunch, have lunch, out again in the afternoon, back for dinner. Dinner would be about, let's see, seven, seven o'clock, I think, for the guests. And then he went back out again, three times a day fishing. He loved it. And he'd usually hire a fishing guide so they know exactly where to go for the fish, you know, make it a little easier for him. So we used to have two stainless steel freezers, about the size of this table, stainless steel, and about that high with big lift up lids. And they'd be stuffed with salmon, big 30 pound salmon for the whole cruising. And then we'd take them back to. Newport Beach here, and he'd either give them away or you know, to, to friends and whatever. So we had a lot of salmon on board. We had a good captain. They used to run gunboats in uh, Mekong Delta. With he stayed three years on board, and we liked him. And Duke was getting bad tempered with his health failing and running out of money and the boat was expensive. And Michael Wayne ran Wayne Enterprises and he didn't like the boat, he thought it was a waste of money. The insurance on the boat was, I think it was 60,000 a year. Total outweigh was around 280,000 a year. He was making 950,000 a movie. So he said, I just have to keep working. He'd make three or four movies a year. So when Jim quit, he recommended to John Wayne that I take over. I'd been the mate and I'd watched how to handle the boat and everything. In fact, years before, Pete Stein says we were anchored at uh, White's Cove and it was my job to haul the anchor in with the electric winch. So Pete was by me and he says, see if he can get us started. In other words, see if he can get the boat underway. So I went, oh, great. So I ran up to the wheelhouse and then Pete changed his mind walks back to the wheelhouse and he takes over. Uh, damn, I could have learned how to drive it. <laughs> so it was years later when Jim, Jim Mail, that was M-A-E-H-L, I think. So he suggested a Duke, and that when Ernie Saftik, the PT boat skipper, heard that, he said, oh, I don't think Bert can handle it. So Duke says, well, let him try. So we arranged a trip to Catalina and I'm full of confidence. I found it pretty easy. They didn't have a flying bridge in those days. The flying bridge is handy because you can look all, all over the bow and down the side of the boat. When I skipped it, I was inside the wheelhouse and to check the side or the docks, I had to run from one side of the wheelhouse to the other and look out of the doorway. But I got used to it and it had the old Navy controls, big cast iron levers with nice polished brass handles and they were like on a ratchet. And I got pretty good at handling those. In fact, one time we had to pick up Barbara Walters at the dock and she was late arriving. So I backed the boat out of the slip and did a 180. So the stern was not too far away from the dock. And just then I heard these, and there was uh, Barbara Walters running down the dock. So I, uh, there's no sweat. I just backed down to the dock gently. In those days, we had walkie-talkie radios. 
so I could be in touch with the deckhand on the back end of the boat and in the wheelhouse. Okay, come back, a couple of feet, one foot. Okay, stop. And I got to stop the boat. She stepped on the swimming platform, nice as pie, and boarded the boat, and then we got underway. And, uh, and that was the last interview, of course. Yeah. Well, after the boat trip, he inv she interviewed him at the house. And uh, while we're in the wheelhouse, I'm staring up the channel by the Balboa Bay Club. And he says to, to tell Billy to send two cups of coffee up. So in those days, we had like a, maybe we got a hold of the steward. And Duke says to Barbara Wallace, would you like something in yours? We don't run a tight ship here. You know. <laughs> In fact, it was like a drop of whiskey in the coffee or something, but uh, she took it straight anyway. But uh, she was cute, I was surprised. She was 42 at the time. Nice, nice tight sweater, and mm, I was giving her the eye, you know. <laughs> Pilar found the house in Newport Beach okay. and bought it without Duke saying it. She was convinced that he would love it on the waterfront and it had its own dock. But the boat was so big, it would have blocked the view from the, the rooms. So we had our own slip in the uh, Lido yacht anchorage. We did occasionally pull up to the house to pick up the, the Waynes and the children and then had off for Catalina. But I think we only did it two or three times. So. Uh, Oh, and right away, uh, 1965, Christmas time, John Wayne decided to remodel the ship. With him being six foot four, he'd have to walk like this up the side deck because uh, of the deck. <laughs> so he wanted to, and the same in the staterooms in the main salon. So we hired five carpenters and myself, because I, I was a shipwright and I'd worked on houses and ships. So uh, we spent five months raising the roof of the after deck and uh, his stateroom. We gave him a six foot eight headroom. So I enjoyed that work, can do my shipwright work. I like to tell the story about young Ethan when he was about two or three years old and we were on the beach at Catalina, just the two of us, and we were walking in the little ripple waves along the beach and suddenly he looks up and he says, do you mind if I call you dad? And I said, oh no, Ethan, that would really hurt your dad's feelings. So he thought, well, just for, just for today. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, we became so close that Pilar thought it'd be cool to go into town to Avalon and buy two matching t-shirts white, kind of nice material, and uh, with black piping around the collar. And so she gave one to me, my size, and one to Ethan. Someone gave Duke uh, an electric fishing reel deal. So I had clamped the stanchion of the boarding ladder, and he liked to fish for sand dabs. And so he'd lower this thing down and just hit a switch and it would run down with all the bait on. And then he'd hit, flick the switch and hit, retrieve this fishing line with all the hooks. And we'd have about half a dozen little sand dams. And he'd have those for breakfast. He loved those. Little Billy the cook would. We had the same cook for a, God, about 13 years, I think. Billy Sweat. He was part Cherokee Indian from, uh, oh, somewhere on the East Coast. I forget the town. He tried to be, he was so small, he tried to be a, a professional jockey at one time. But uh, that didn't work out, so he ended up cooking on the wild goose. And at one time, John Wayne came into the salon, the, the, the galley where we used to eat, and put his hand on No crew was going to eat as good as the crew on the wild goose. And boy, he was right. We used to have the best steaks. They may have come from his ranch. Uh, he had a partner in a ranch. 
Uh, yeah, I can't remember the guy's name. But that was the, probably the best business proposition he got involved in, get a share in the ranch in Arizona. The boat originally was a wartime, World War II minesweeper, all wood. It was double uh, wood planking on the hull. I think it was an inch inner skin and a two inch outer skin, or it might have been the other way around. And they were around 320 tons, it was a, the weight displacement. And after the war, there must have been dozens of these wooden ships for, for sale. People would buy three of them, two or three, and cannibalize a couple and fix up one with the, with the parts. And Max decided it'd be fun to go sail around the world when he first bought it and invite a few of his friends and they had children so they made the room beneath the galley into a schoolroom. and they got as far as Hawaii and they were leaving Hawaii to carry on across the ocean and an old navy fitting fell off the bottom of the ship because the wood was rotten something to do with the sonar equipment so it left a big hole in the hull water's gushing in so they called the coast guard and they limped back into Hawaii by then, Max realized that this wasn't going to work. His friends and the children on board, and people getting seasick. You know. So he gave up the idea of the world cruise and brought the boat back to Seattle. So about, about entertainment on the boat. Uh, it was costing John Wayne about almost 300,000. No, see, the insurance was 60,000 a month. So it was a huge expense. Every movie he made, he'd make about 950,000. Well, if he was alive today, he'd be making 20 million. <laughs> but anyway, uh, to help the expenses, he used to rent it out, or charter the boat. And one time, Tom Jones came from Vegas and it was a tax dodge. He was only allowed to work so many days in the States and they had to leave and re-enter. So to make it legal for him, he chartered the boat and we'd cruise down to Mexico, leave the country for a day or two, and then head back into the States. And the first time he was on board, he said to me and one of the other crewmen, he said, if I'd have known you guys were swingers, I'd have brought more girls. <laughs> he brought cute little teenager for him, you know, and uh, some of the band members had brought girlfriends. I think there were three or four band members on board. So he, he made a, <laughs> it was an enjoyable trip for him. So <laughs> One time Sammy Davis chartered the boat and uh, it was a good holiday from Vegas for him, for him. But he was on his own, he just wanted to kick back and relax. So from Monday, I think he joined the boat on the Monday, Sunday or Monday. But anyway, one morning we'd gone, I guess it was, we picked up his wife and about half a dozen friends at uh, Avalon. So we cruised around to the backside of Catalina and Sammy realized he couldn't get a good TV signal. So he comes up, I'm shaving in this cruise head thing. And uh, I guess I was the mate at that time. And Sammy slaps his pocket. He says, I want to get this damn TV fixed. I don't care what it costs, I got it on me. <laughs> so I said, Sammy, we're on the wrong side of the island. We can't get a signal here. We've got to go back to White's call. OK, he calmed down. So we go back to White's, and he was happy. <laughs> but uh, uh, whenever John Wayne was on board, he, in his spare time, if he wasn't going for a swim off the back end, by the way, he, he'd go for a swim, but no matter where we were, it might have been Mexico, and nice warm water, he'd dive in and come to the surface, Jesus Christ, it's cold. <laughs> and sometimes he'd swim with a little Ethan or Marisa, you know. And so, uh, oh, he tried water skiing when he was still in Mexico. So maybe, maybe it was another trip later on when we got back to the States, they went back down to the, every winter we'd head back to Mexico. And he figured he could use the boat at weekends on the Sunday, um, Saturday and Sunday. But he, 
while he was making movies in Mexico, he had to work Sundays. I only gave him one day, or Saturdays rather. He only had one day Sunday to fly back to Cabo San Lucas or La Paz or wherever we were. You know. So he decided it wasn't worth it. So we'd be stuck in Mexico. <laughs> and to make more money, he'd charter it. And remember the owner of the Hurrah Hotel, Hurrah's, he chartered it one time for about five days. I like to drive the ski boat, and uh, so I get to, I tell one of the guests, you drive and I let me ski. So I got to be a pretty good skier. <laughs> uh, one time I was driving the ski boat. This is a few years after, probably in the late 60s. And little, well, Ethan was about four years old. A little after when he wanted to call me dad, you know. So I'm in the ski boat, just the two of us, and I'm, I pull in the ski line. I said to Ethan, I don't touch that line. And I go, grab the wheel and open the throttle a little. Oh, no, no. After I told Ethan that don't touch the throttle while I'm calling the line, of course, right away he hits the throttle. Just sort of, and I almost got fall overboard off the back end of the boat. And I said, I, you know, came up to him, grabbed his neck. I said, you little son of a bitch. Didn't I tell you not to touch? <laughs> he just laughs at me. He goes, do that again. <laughs> he got a kick out of that. Ooh, do that again, he says. <laughs> so anyway. From what I read from your book, you were an extra on some of these films? Yeah, we, if there was any chance of making money, Duke would let it you know, rent it out to film companies. So we were doing a one in Acapulco. It was a TV Tarzan segment. Ron Ely, who used to go to USC, big strapping blonde, about six foot three, you know, good looking actor. So he's on board. They asked me, they wanted to stage a fight on the top deck. So they asked me, would you want to, oh, they dressed me in Captain Pete style like Arabs, with funny hats and long flowing robes. You know? <laughs> and they thought it'd be fun to hire me as a stuntman on the top deck and get into a fight with Tarzan. And then another guy said, oh, well, we're worried about insurance, so you better not do it, you know, in case I got hurt, you know, I'd sue them. <laughs> so, uh, one time, Ernie Saftik, a good friend and neighbor that lived on Lederweil, he was an ex-PT boat skipper during the war. And I think when he made the movie, they were expendable. It was all about the motor torpedo boats. That they became friends, so they were lifelong friends. And uh, Ernie one day said, you know, we should go to San Nicolas Island. It's just loaded with uh, abalone, was it? So uh, we sailed there, and we'd had a, some custom face masks made, triangular, for John Wayne. His head was so big, you know. <laughs> so he decides to go scuba diving. We had the tanks on board. And it was my first time with tanks. So I'm anxious to get down, see, to breathe through the deal. And I went down about 12 feet, and he, he was close by. And I'm going, I couldn't breathe properly. Oh no, it was my ears. My ears were aching. I, I couldn't grab my nose. <laughs> so I'm struggling, and I'm going, I can't do this. I'm going to go. And just then I noticed John Wayne doing the same. He was struggling. And so he, we both go and hit the surface and we explain. I, I explain about my ears hurting. So later on, we're having dinner, and it wasn't unusual for John Wayne to wander into the salon and start BSing with the crew to be the captain, the mate. Well, I became the mate pretty early, but, uh, and if it was a spare seat, he'd sit down and start BSing with the crew, you know. So one evening, he sits down across from me. He says, I knew you, white tooth bastard. Why didn't you go down deeper? And so I, uh, I said, well, my ears were hurting. And he says, yeah, I know what you mean. I picked up an infection at the studios in the water tank when he made a, one of the movies there where he had to do some diving. So uh, I got a kick out of that. <laughs> 
every movie that John Wayne made, he would give all his employees, including the crew on the goose, a coffee mug. They were made in Crown Del Mar, by the way. Uh, I forget the name of the company. They moved up to Long Beach. Anyway. But uh, each mug would have your name on one side, and on the back side would be a, a little character of each movie he made. After the boat had sold, in fact, I was working for Julie Andrews at the time, I think, and I had a collection of 15 or 16 coffee mugs, and I found out I could sell them on eBay. And so I sold them for $5,000. I told my brother, Ken, and he had about the same amount. He maybe he had one extra, maybe 16, 17. But his wife wouldn't let, let him sell them. Don't you sell those mugs, you know? It might be worth something, but who knows? My favorite movie, I think, has to be The Quiet Man that he made in Ireland. I'm trying to think of the year, was it 53 maybe? That whole town is, commemorates that movie. There's all kinds of memorabilia in that town. Uh, let's see. I guess his children were in that movie too. There's a scene where they do a horse race and the children are seated on a, a like a hand cart or a horse cart. And you'll see, uh, see who was the pretty girl, the redhead, Maureen O'Hara. <laughs> oh, yeah, that helps, the, the phone. Anyway. I remember another little story. She came down to visit Duke, because they were such close friends. He used to call her my favorite guy, because she was just one of the boys. So we were in the, doing the remodeling in Newport Beach, and Duke warned me, I'm expecting Maureen O'Hara, keep an eye out for her. So Ken and I are in the galley up forward, and we hear these footsteps tripping down the gangway. So I get up and look, and it's Maureen O'Hara walking down the dock. So, oh, and Duke, just then, Duke had decided to go to the bathroom <laughs> for a pee. <laughs> so I, I meet, go to meet Maureen O'Hara and invite her on board at the boarding ladder. And I said, oh, Mr. Wayne will be right with you. He just went to the toilet. And she looked at me and laughed. She said, oh, you didn't have to tell me that. She said, <laughs> I felt such a dummy. <laughs> Uh, I, I should have just said, Mr. Wayne will be right with you. And I, I opened my big mouth. Oh, he just went to the toilet. <laughs> uh, I got a call about two years ago from Hornblow, who the owners of the yacht, and asked me if I was interested in telling some sea stories to the guests on board. So, sure, so make a little extra money. You know? So, I think two years ago, they paid me $100 a speech. <laughs> and uh, the next year, they bumped it up to 150 And then last year, I was getting 300 There was only seven, seven nights, seven uh, dinner cruises. I only got to speak on a big, full-on dinner cruise. Then they do a meet and greet, and I can make $75 for a meet and greet, so it's pretty easy money. <laughs> but I've always been deathly afraid of public speaking. I remember at school being a 13, 14 year old, and the teacher had us doing some project, and some of the boys had to stand out in front and give their version of this project. I think it was about the England's economic crisis or something in the mid-50s, I guess, or late 40s. So I remember thinking, oh, I don't want to go in, in front of the class. I was terrified in case the teacher called me, you know, and luckily he didn't. So I remember being that young, terrified of being speaking. You know. About four or five years ago, a friend invited me to the lunch at the Newport Harbour Yacht Club. And there were only about 20 people there. And I thought I'd just go and eat and listen to whoever 
was going to speak. And so that guy that's running the lunch and says, he's at the dais, you know, about that high. He says, we have a very special guest here today, Captain Bert Menchel, John Wayne's captain. So he, I got roped up in the cup. <laughs> It's fun to be back on board again, doing these charters with the hornblower. And it gives me a chance to reminisce about the, the good times that I had on the Wild Goose. I, I'm upset the way the boat appears, because one of the owners that sold it to hornblower didn't know a damn thing about boats. So he, in fact, he met, mentioned to me one day, he said, it looks like you guys ran out of money when you did the remodeling last time. Because it was the stability situation was just marginal when John Wayne had the boat. There used to be a boat company in town, a sea boat company. And they, the captain, Pete Stein, would have the, the owner of the company come down and how they tested the stability. They'd fill 40 gallon oil drums on the top deck, maybe half a dozen on, on one side full of water to get the boat leaning. And that way they could decide how stable it was. And so it was marginal. And now this new guy bought the boat and stretched Duke's cabin all the way aft. He got all this extra lumber on high up. So the boat is very unstable now. They're not allowed to go outside the harbor just once a week, uh, once a year rather, to get the bottom painted up in Long Beach. So that. I'm like a lot of people who knew the boat before, they're upset the way it appears now. Yeah.